Welcome to the U Street Corridor, a historically African-American neighborhood in the nation's capital. From the Jim Crow laws of the early 1900s to the riots of the 1960s and development efforts of the new millennium, this city within a city has been a hub for top entertainers, social activists, and black-owned businesses. We're going to hear stories from three such businesses, Ben's Chili Bowl, Industrial Bank, and Lee's Flower Shop all which benefited from U Street's thriving African-American community, Black Broadway. My husband and I opened Ben's on August 22nd, 1958. And this was still a segregated community, but a very classy one. When we met and fell in love and wanted to be married, he wanted to be self-employed. So what else to do but a restaurant? Okay, I agreed to that, and then he wanted to pick the right spot. Where do we go to open a restaurant? We want to go where there are people all the time. U Street was perfect, like Broadway. My dad uh, was in business with his brother. Uh, they had a flower business up on uh, Georgia and W Street. And uh, then my dad started, uh, you know, started his own shop. And that's when my mom came into play and they ran that shop together for several, several years. We relocated here in 1968, as a matter of fact. Four generations and, and also a fifth coming up. Mm -hmm. A 10 year old granddaughter that comes in here and helps out. Uh, we're Industrial Bank. Uh, we were started in 1934 by my grandfather. And my father ran the bank for 40 years. The original location was down at 11th and U Street. We do know that the bank started because there wasn't any other black bank to serve blacks in 1934. And there was a prior bank at the same location, but that bank went out of business during the Depression when President Roosevelt came into office in 1932, and then they weren't allowed to reopen. So that left the city, left the blacks in Washington, D.C. with no bank. Yeah, so there were a number of people that really wanted to have another black bank in the city. So they encouraged our grandfather to open a bank. And I wonder at that time, did they really envision it lasting 85 years? We had remodeled what was known as an oh, the Minnehaha Theater, which was an old silent movie theater. And uh, in the process of getting it done as a restaurant, we were able to find everything we needed here in this community. So we were able to find the plumber, the electrician, the cabinet maker, the architect, the contractor, everything within five or six blocks of here. You couldn't go shopping downtown in the white stores. You could not go to the white theater. You could not go to the white restaurants. So you created your own black community, your own black economic base. The black dollar stayed in the black community. Doctors, lawyers, architects, Howard University and walking distance, so it was a thriving community. And we were able to um, just be very happy with what was going on here. There was a lot of places to party, a lot of places to shop. Everybody knew everybody. You go to your barber shop, your barber knows you, knows how to cut your hair, you know, and tell them, you know, he got you because you're in there every couple of weeks. Beauty shops all up and down here. Um, you know, so it was fantastic. It was, it was a great area. I mean, really, you couldn't have asked for a better spot. In the early 1900s, the Jazz Age hit Washington, D.C. Unable to attend the clubs downtown, black entrepreneurs opened their own clubs. Some of the most popular were Thundercat, Crystal Caverns, and the Jungle Inn, which later became the Casbah, and today is Ben's Next Door. The Casbah was a very popular blues and jazz joint here on the Black Broadway. This was the favorite club of Pearl Bailey. She liked to hang out here after she played in the major theaters up and down the Strip. In this spot, a reporter asked Bailey why the street was so important. She replied with, they won't let us play on the Broadway, so we'll create U Street as our Black Broadway. And so the moniker was born. The Lincoln Theater, one of only two theaters that still stand today, was a popular movie house and ballroom. It regularly hosted music icons such as DC native and jazz royalty, Duke Ellington, Billie Holiday, Ella Fitzgerald, Cab Calloway, Louis Armstrong, Jelly Roll Morton, Lionel Hampton, Sarah Vaughn, and Pearl Bailey. Across the street from the Lincoln Theater, Ben's Chili Bowl, and the Casbah, now Ben's Next Door, history was also being made at 1250 U Street. Right here, 
1250, which was the headquarters of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. This was when Marion Barry or Stokely Carmichael or Eleanor Holmes Norton and all those great leaders of the SNCC, when they wanted to meet and eat, they go right across the street. So the convenience of putting food and culture and history and organizing together was in this one spot. And down the street stood the main social hall of the community. It's called the True Reformer Building, and this was built in 1903. This was designed by an African-American architect from Howard University named John Lankford. It was built with black money from black banks. It was built by black workers, and it becomes the social hall of what we refer to as the black bourgeoisie. So the True Reformer Building was really the major social cultural hall of the Black Broadway. The big change came, of course, in 1968 when Dr. King was assassinated. I remember that night so vividly when someone just rushed into the door and said, Dr. King's been shot. Well, we were in disbelief. That can't be. And then someone else comes in with the same story and someone else. And finally, we get a transistor radio and we turn that on and we learn that not only has he been shot, but it was fatal. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I'm only going to talk to you just for a minute or so this evening because I have some very sad news for all of you, and I think uh, sad news for all of our fellow citizens and people who love peace all over the world, and that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis, Tennessee. So people were coming in in tears, crying. We were all crying and very upset. How could our wonderful, gentle, kind leader die so violently? The sadness after a while turned into a bit of fr frustration. Frustration turned to anger. And the uprising began. So we're standing here at 14th and U, which many of us consider ground zero for the rebellion that occurred after Dr. King was assassinated on April 4th, 1968. Now that corner housed the People's Drug Store. People's Drug Store did not hire African Americans within this African American community, meaning the money that came into this store did not recirculate into the black community. Highly agitated with the death of Dr. King, they found a way to strike out, and that was to attack those stores that did not hire black people in a black community. The first brick that went through the window was right there at People's Drug Store. So when the brick went through the window and then the store was looted and then somebody put the store on fire, the fire trucks obviously came down to try to put out the fire and the people said, no, don't put out the fire. We burned it because we wanted to burn. Unfortunately, however, what happens is that the fire begins to jump from roof to roof and eventually it begins to burn black businesses down. And then there were these just, just gangs of young of people just when you when I'm going home in the evening. It's, you just see a gang of young people crossing the street. You don't know what they're about to do. And Molotov cocktails were going into the windows of stores, especially those that were closed at night and that kind of thing. It was, it was horrific. I had the experience of feeling what tear gas feels like in your eye. It was scary. It was really very, very scary. It was really horrible. The National Guard was called in. They're right outside your front door. Our mayor at that time decided we should have a curfew put in place. We were in a curfew three nights. Vince Chilibo was the only place allowed to remain open, and that kind of provided a place for first responders, police officers, city officials or anyone that wanted to come in, at least take a break, have something to eat or coffee, and try to find a way to quell the violence. We were worried about who was doing this, you know what I mean, and what and what we were going to get hit, because we all, I mean, smoke all around us, you know, fires and all that. We didn't know who was doing it, whether it was uh, black folk doing it because they were mad about Martin Luther King, or white folk doing it to wipe us out, or what, we didn't know who it was, you know, so anyway, uh, we got the idea to put, we put, wrote on our window, it was uh, soap, soul grub, in case it was black folk. That's, 
that's that's the first decision that we made, okay? And then we decided to stay all night uh, because, you know, we didn't want to leave the store unattended. There wasn't any damage done to the bank. No. I know that um, one of our former employees, she told me a story about um, when, during that time when people would want to throw a brick through the glass and she would say, no, I'm one of you, so they wouldn't throw the brick. But after that period was over, there were lots of businesses. Many of them did not reopen after having been literally destroyed. And then middle class African Americans began to move away. And we just took a downhill turn for 20 years. The entire community during the time of, um, after the uprising, people were afraid to come. It was, it, was, it was just a fear. I mean, there were drug addicts and there was crime. First, the, the heroin moved in, then crack cocaine moved in. 14th and U was prominent in that. Um, just a really difficult time, really a very difficult time. Drugs, prostitution, crime. If you drove your car down the street, you wanted to come in and get a hot dog. By the time you got back, it was broken into. It was just that bad. Uh, I can remember the payphone being used as a communication tool for, for drug activity. It was the hood, mm -hmm. and I was in pretty bad, pretty bad shape. When I worked at the U Street branch as a teenager, um, my mother wouldn't want me to walk from U Street down, walk down U Street to go catch the bus to go home by myself. But uh, right after the riots, uh, then drug dealers started coming down here selling drugs on the corners and whatnot. So I had to call the police almost every day. That that was kind of traumatic. Uh, yeah, so it wasn't one thing, it was another. Business wasn't powerful, it wasn't great then, of course not. The time that was slowest and there was absolutely no business was when you had that no street out front. But the challenges didn't end there. In the 1980s, Washington, D.C. leaders decided to build part of the city's subway system under the U Street Corridor. When they did the research, they found only three businesses, local businesses in the immediate vicinity had survived. Industrial Bank, Lee's Flower Shop, and Bench Chili Bowl. Not enough to maintain one lane of traffic out there. They simply dug up the entire street, 65 feet deep, to build our subway system. That was really the most difficult because you couldn't get here. There was no, not one car passing on this wide black Broadway street. And it took a long time because there was a lot of issues with the contractors and the contractors had filed bankruptcy and so the project would stall. So it took years. So right on this, on this side, on the, you know, this side of the sidewalk is where the fence was because they had the whole street was dug up. And then the end, what that did was put a lot of black businesses out of business because they couldn't survive. If you don't have customers, you're not making money. You can't survive. I mean, that, that was terrible. It was a travesty, really. Yeah, unfortunately, like, like our business, uh, a lot of it's over the phone. So we still had loyal customers calling in, and, and the driver had to walk down the street to get to his truck. But we still made it. You know, we made it through. So thanks, thanks be to God, we made it through. In 1992, I think it was, the subway opened. I had a big old banner put across the building that said, we survived Metro. Once it was completed, U Street opened up. There were a lot of cars, cars everywhere, and there was people, and then businesses started to come. The first new business moved in, and the second and third. So now we are a thriving community again. All I, all I know is people treat you the way you treat them, and I've been treated well here. We, we treat our customers like family. So, you know, we try to be loyal and committed to them, and in return, they're loyal and committed to us. You know, we're proud of, of, of all of our businesses. I think we've, we've done a, a, a wonderful job. The community has supported us, and uh, so I'm thankful. The fact that I get up in the mornings at 85 and want to come here, tells you how happy I am with what's happened here over these years. It's been, it's not been easy, and it's still not easy, but uh, it's been a pleasure to be here to serve the Washington, D.C. community, and I'm grateful to the community and to my sons for 
uh, their participation in making this work. Growing, I grew up on this street, and I could walk up and down here. I could go in the stores, and, and, and everybody knew me. I knew them. They looked out for me, you know, and, and uh, we all looked out for each other. And everybody cared about each other. You didn't have you didn't have crime, very little crime, you know. And um, that's just you know we need to bring that back. We need to bring back uh, uh, a community where love is in charge. And as new generations take the helm of U Street's three legacy businesses, urban renewal continues to revitalize a neighborhood deeply ingrained with history.